So if anybody's filing in right now, we're just giving it a tick to let people get their virtual seats and get settled um, before we get started. Welcome to today's master class. My name is Lisa Richter and I will be your host today. On the off chance that you don't know about CSIA, we are a global nonprofit trade association with over 500 members in 35 countries. For system integrator members, the CSIA best practices manual and certification are some of the more popular member benefits, but they also enjoy a variety of others, including professional development, learning from their peers, and access to professional services experts, including insurance, financial, and legal, who understand the SI's unique business needs. For partner members, CSIA offers an ecosystem to grow their SI programs, understand their customers' pain points, monitor industry trends, and share their thought leadership. <laughs> so yeah, this just keeping me on my toes here this morning. Um, with thousands of qualified integrators and suppliers, the CSIA Industrial Automation Exchange helps SIs, industry suppliers, and manufacturers connect and do business. For SIs and partners, it provides a platform to support your content and SEO marketing efforts, position yourself as a thought leader, and nurture prospects during their complicated buyer's journey. The good news is that we are now halfway through the year and both membership dues and exchange profile upgrades are prorated, which just is a fancy way of saying they're half off. And we've put together a first timer package for companies that join in July and August that includes some new member benefits, including an EPUB of new products and services called Innovation for Integration. The package includes a free listing in this new EPUB, but also some other goodies to help you get your message and brand in front of your customers. Get all the details at www.controlsys.org backslash shine. At this time, I would like to introduce James Ricker and Daryl Gilbert. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Lisa, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we are extremely excited to be joining CSIA as a new partner member. We actually joined earlier this year, and we are very grateful again for the opportunity, not only to be a member, but also to talk to all of your integrator members across the organization on what is arguably one of the most important topics in the country, uh, cybersecurity. And so we've got a great discussion lined up for you today. Uh, due to the amount of people we have on the call, when you dialed in, all the lines are muted, but we like to have these be informal and as much conversational as possible. So during the call, please use the Q&A feature or the chat function and ask any questions or provide any comments. And we'll make sure at the end of the call, we get to all of your feedback. Uh, again, use that feature. Um, we'd love to have um, this more of a two-way discussion as much as possible. Uh, with us joining earlier this year, I have to say, Lisa and Sandra, I've been extremely impressed with the tools, the thought leadership, and the resources that CSIA provides its member companies to help them support their growth of their businesses and address the evolving trends in the marketplace. Before we get into the content, I wanted to start the presentation by introducing myself and my co-presenter, Dale Gilbert. My name is James Ricker with Graybar Electric and I am the national market manager for our industrial business. I'm responsible for our strategy, our marketing, sales enablements, and ultimately ensuring that our sales teams have the right tools and resources to best support our customers for their industrial automation needs. I've been with the company for over 15 years in a variety of capacities from business developments, marketing, sales leadership, and now into this role, and I'm really, really excited to be part of the CSIA organization to engage with your members and to better work with them to design, deliver, and deploy industrial automation solutions. With me today is Daryl Gilbert, one of our industrial automation sales engineers. Daryl is a vocal advocate for OT cybersecurity and has close ties to industry experts with a unique insight into the needs, opportunities, and risks associated to end users and also to system integrators. He is an industry veteran with over 30 years experience in the industrial market. 
Daryl brings a wide breadth of experience from pneumatic controls through IIoT analytics. Daryl has worked as a system integrator prior to joining Graybar and has a deep understanding of this market and the opportunities ahead for cybersecurity. Daryl, if you wouldn't mind sharing the screen, I'd like to take a moment to give a high level overview of Graybar and our business uh, today. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so who is Graybar? Graybar is a leading distributor of electrical lighting, communications, data networking, MRO, industrial automation, and security products. We have a wide breadth of manufacturers that we support and service. And across the business, we have 292 North American locations. This infrastructure allows us to best support our customers across the, mar across the country, agnostic of what market they're in, and leverage our vast investment and in inventory to best service their needs. We have 8,200 employees across our business and almost half of those are in sales positions. As a distributor, we sell products, but it's our people and our technological expertise that differentiates us from the market. We focus heavily on having the right people with the proper competency to best serve our customers. This is especially critical when supporting our system integrators and our industrial customers with their industrial automation needs. We have invested in technical specialists around the country that can support customers when they are looking to design, maintain, or optimize their industrial automation platform. Our mission is to work closely with our customers to understand their unique priorities, goals, and challenges, and then develop a customized solution that helps them increase productivity improve quality, reduce downtime, manage energy, provide a safer workplace, and ultimately target the business outcome they're looking to achieve. Systems integrators play a critical role in the design, delivery, and implementation of industrial automation solutions, and we are very excited to partner with your members. Raybar currently works with a number of your members across the business today, but if we've not had a chance to collaborate yet, I very much look forward to engaging with you and your company and have included my contact information at the end of this presentation. In our industry, we have seen great advancements in IoT solutions that allow our customers to gain real-time insights into the processes and operations, reduce unplanned downtime via predictive maintenance, and improve their operational efficiency by tapping into all the data that comes from their connected devices. Unfortunately, as our industrial control systems become more connected, there is a broader surface area for bad actors to target disruption of our critical infrastructure, our business operations, and our economy. We have seen the pace of these cyber security attacks grow at a rapid pace and evolve from phishing scams to ransomware, ranging from the solar winds attack to the water treatment attack we saw earlier this year from in Florida to the colonial pipeline ransomware. And as cybersecurity market evolves, it is critical that we have the proper protocols, tools, and solutions that will help us protect our critical assets. Our goal today is to provide an overview of trends in the market and outline some ways that system integrators can incorporate cybersecurity services and solutions into their portfolio. With that, I would like to hand it off to our presenter, Daryl Gilbert. Take it away, Daryl. Thank you, James. I appreciate that. And uh, very well said. Um, today's challenges for systems integrators and our end user customers is great and vast. So what we're going to cover today are some entries into the cybersecurity services that you can offer. This is not an in-depth. Um, everything covered from a cybersecurity perspective or services that should be offered. This is simply an introduction. If you have uh, cybersecurity services that you're currently providing customers, uh, you may get some things out of this. But if you currently don't have any cybersecurity services or internal procedures and processes in place, please listen carefully as you may find some thought provoking information as we move through this. The things we're going to cover today are 
Cybersecurity risks that systems integrators face today, seen and unseen. Customer facing cybersecurity discussions that you should be having with your customers. And what are the gaps from cybersecurity on the OT and ICS, industrial control systems today? And then last, we're gonna cover what are those, some of those market entry service solutions that you can be offering your customers today. This is a concept of services that you could be offering. It's, uh, it's not set in stone, but it is revolved around an ISA document, um, International Society of Automation, uh, 62443. And it's about um, providing coverage and solutions and securing uh, ICS systems. So the reason these concepts are important, not only for you, but for your customers, are to generate revenue, service revenue uh, for your company, and to offset some of the rising operating costs that you're going to incur as we move forward in the cybersecurity age. It also provides you a path of collaboration from the C-suite of your customers all the way down into the plant floor and gives you the opportunity to be fully integrated with your customers at every level and at every upgrade, path, and turn. Items we're not going to cover today. This is not a technical presentation on cybersecurity. Um, we're not going to get into the technical terms or the technical aspects of um, executing a cybersecurity management system. We're not going to talk about asset risk assessments, security countermeasures, or security framework. Although security framework will be mentioned at the end of the presentation simply as an overview. As we have to understand the market today, we have to understand and look internally. As a systems integrator, what message do you communicate to your employees about cybersecurity? Internal, they're personal. How much conversation do you actually have with them and what actions do they take on a daily basis that affect your business? What are your internal policies and procedures concerning cybersecurity? I'm sure you have an IT person on staff, but how does that follow down to the everyday workings of your employees and their access to your systems? So why is this important? Well, in today's day and age, with electronics, iPhones, Androids, tablets, malware, email, Gmail accounts, and so on, there are so many doors into your organization that you need to be able to protect. Think about the keys to the kingdom that you hold in your organizations today and how many companies you have access to, whether that be to, to go into their facility or doing remote access. There is a liability factor here. So on a scale from one to 10, think about this for a moment. Rate your firm's exposure to a cyber risk or cyber intrusion. Now, if you really put a lot of thought into this, I would say that this number would probably be close to eight. Um, it's a scary thought when we really start thinking about it. One of the things we really need to consider as a systems integrator is, do we carry cyber security insurance? As we move forward, your customers are going to be requiring you to carry some sort of cybersecurity insurance. The Colonial Pipeline hack recently has shined a bright light on the need to secure our ISC systems, ICS systems. They're legacy systems. They're insecure by design. You hold the keys to their kingdom because we're the ones that are working on them every day. So what training do you have internally? What trainings do you provide to your, 
to your um, employees? It's an interesting question. And where do you start? Where do we start from educating our employees and our management and our sales staff on automation, cybersecurity? Well, one of the best places to start is through ISA. Um, ISA has generated, um, initially it was ISA 99 and has uh, since transitioned over into ISA 62443. Um, and they have certificate programs, which is a great place to start um, to all levels of your organization. So these certificate programs, first is the uh, Cybersecurity Fundamental Specialist. Um, it is the first certificate. Second, Cybersecurity Risk Assessment Specialist. Third, Cybersecurity Design Specialist. And the fourth, Cybersecurity Maintenance Specialist. What I will tell you is each one of these and the topics that is discussed and trained during these certificate programs will help you implement a cybersecurity program for your customers. So we have to understand the market from the customer's perspective. And as a systems integrator, what do you communicate one moment. What questions do you communicate to your employees about cybersecurity when you're talking actually to the customer? So what message do you communicate to your customers around cybersecurity? What message should you communicate to your customers around cybersecurity? For the obvious things, there's the health and safety risk of their staff. There's an environmental risk if there was uh, an intrusion. The obvious of asset and intellectual property. The operational shutdowns and downtime. And the financial source loss associated with all of the above. Now, when we really start thinking about these in terms of our customers, most of our customers have an IT staff that is protecting their IT assets. Let's call them the bean counters, if we will. Uh, and the bean counters, they love to count their beans. But if we're not manufacturing product, they have no beans to count. This is an unseen threat. The term insurance is, is probably most fitting in cybersecurity today because it is insurance. Once you're affected, you're done. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit further. So systems integrators, typically when it comes to cybersecurity services, for most, it's an all or nothing. They provide all aspects of cybersecurity services. They have a specialized skilled team of employees which carries a significant investment in personnel. They typically offer these services to large corporations, and typically they are larger systems integrators. And they also may offer these services because of regulatory compliance of the customers that they work with, uh, possibly NERC SIP, uh, nuclear agencies, DOD, things such as this. For those that don't, where is your entry into uh, industrial cybersecurity? Coined the term industrial cyber insurance services, um, kind of puts it out there as a, a service that you can utilize. There are many different aspects to this, and this is not meant to cover 100% of all the things that need to be done when implementing uh, cybersecurity services to a customer. As you develop your plan, your plan will grow and you will implement more services, more capabilities within your organization to provide more in-depth of defense structures to your customers as well as to your employees and your companies. So the first 
is an asset discovery and documentation. We cannot monitor what we can't see or what we don't know that we have. The second is information and document management. It's gathering all the information that we took from our asset discovery and our documentation phase. And we package it up and we store it. And we keep it for that day that we wish never comes. The third, the ISC search advisory and remedy action plan. And I will go into depth on each one of these as we move forward. Automated OT network monitoring. Many products out there today. I'm not going to mention one thing you'll find about this presentation today is uh, the only product or company that you're going to hear was be the name Graybar. Uh, think of this as a public service announcement uh, for our systems integrator partners. Um, the time for this is today. We cannot wait. Um, or the United States cannot wait for anyone to halt and not move forward with this initiative. We need to be working together to protect to protect our critical infrastructure and our manufacturing as things move forward. And the last is the disaster recovery support. So an OT asset discovery and documentation, again, if you don't have access to this uh, ISA standard, I highly recommend it, uh, the ISA 62443 um, for the complete list of what you've been looking at in this discovery phase. This is simply a subset and an overview of what we should be looking at. Certainly all of the network devices on the plant floor that are sub segregated from IT down. We need to inventory and map all the serial devices, wireless devices and wireless networks, all programming terminals and engineering stations. And when you're on site, this one's a little tricky with the programming terminals and engineering stations, because if you do some OT uh, network monitoring, it's going to be looking at MAC addresses, and it's going to be fact, uh, filtering on those and alerting on MAC addresses. And so when contractors come in and come out, we need to be able to understand who they are, what equipment they're connecting to, Where's the laptop then? What are their security procedures? And these are the things we need to be communicating to our customers on a daily basis about the risks of other companies coming in to your good customers, your primary customers, and putting them at risk. Documentation and backup. We should all have this, but at the end of the day, most of the customers don't have a simple, accurate, simple network diagram. It's hard to believe today, but I can't tell you how many customers I go into and they just don't have it. Or they've done it two years ago and it hasn't been updated. We need a backup of all PCs, IPCs, HMIs, and PLC-based devices. The interesting thing is, I would have to say that probably 40% of customers have devices sitting out there that they don't have backups to and they don't even know that they exist. Um, that's a problem. And we all know that when a piece of equipment fails and nobody has the accurate backup, what do we end up having to do? We end up having to jump through hoops, get it kind of working and then work through startup commissioning and the Q&A side of quality. When we could get them right back up and running and then work through a migration path to get them back on the right track and update. So as you're going through this process, make sure you record the date, location, and function of each device. The manufacturer, the model number, and the firmware of what is in each device. And each one of these are critical to where we are going with this. On the IPCs and the PLCs and the PCs, excuse me, the OS version, what are the installed application and what are the version information that are associated with those 
applications. And as we've said before, the MAC address, our assigned IP address, all these need to be documented. Over and above that, if at all possible, record all access account usernames and passwords. Now, when we talk about this, you're thinking, wow, they're going to give me access to all these usernames and passwords. We're talking about on the plant floor, I'm not talking about on an IT network. And on the plant floor, if you're integral with this customer, and when we start looking at uh, the disaster recovery side of this, these are things that are absolutely positively needed. The information and documentation management phase of this is where you're going to become integral with these customers from the plant manager to the CEO all the way down to the maintenance personnel. And it is critical that you understand this and provide these services. The first is we need to do an offsite storage of the discovery and documentation phase. If we look at Colonial Pipeline and we look at why they didn't pump oil, and everybody says, they say, well, we, we certainly could have operated in manual, um, and it wasn't that we couldn't bill, and everybody says, well, the reason they weren't pumping oil, uh, it wasn't on the OT network, it was their business network, and they couldn't bill, and that's why they weren't shipping product. That's not the case. If you really think about it, where are all their SOPs? Where was their cyber response plan, which they did have? Which, where was their cyber recovery plan? What was their plant startup plan? What, what was their plan for operating in, ma in manual? We all know those things aren't printed today. They're on the network. But guess what? Their IT systems were inscripted. They had no access to any of this information. If they would have taken the simple step of working with the systems integrator or another type company and done offsite storage, they would have had access to all of this. And we wouldn't have won a week or two without any gas, hopefully. So we move into ISC search. So you ask, what is an ISC search? Hopefully everybody on this call is aware of the ISC cert. It's the Industrial Control System Computer Emergency Response Team. These are the guys that investigate and work with manufacturers to, to eliminate or work through migrations of uh, affected vulnerabilities in our industrial control system products. So the CISA, uh, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, is part of the Department of Homeland Security. They provide two um, types of advisories or alerts, if you will. The first is an alert. An alert is uh, provides the timely notification to critical infrastructure owners and operators concerning threats to critical infrastructure networks. Now, what I'll tell you about alerts are um, typically you have to be designated as a critical infrastructure. You have to have a designated person that has has met the secret uh, security clearances to get this information. Um, it is not just openly available. Uh, basically, what's going to happen is if uh, if a nation state actor is actively pursuing um, a specific industry and they have caught wind of this or they know about it, they're going to notify these people uh, that are on that list for that those alerts. Um, if there's a specific vulnerability that is being targeted, that will also be shared with them. For the most part, it's not public information. When does it become public information? Well, it becomes public information when they provide and publish the advisories. The advisories are the things that we will be acting on as we move forward. Typically, when an alert comes out, um, 
there's a notification to the manufacturer. The manufacturer has a certain amount of time to address these, at which such time those are still um, had their class, it's classified information, certainly, as, as it should be. Uh, we don't want it, uh, the vulnerabilities being uh, addressed. So when the advisory comes out, the advisory provides a timely information about the current security issue, vulnerability, and the exploit. Now, most of the time when these advisories come out, um, there is already a mitigation in place that you can provide or the customer can provide uh, to mitigate these, um, these vulnerabilities. So let's look at one of these advisories so we can become familiar with it. When you go to the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency's website, and you're more than welcome to do a Google search on ICS cert, and it should bring you to this page. One of the things you'll notice is the alerts with a little lock on it on the left. You would have to be logged in to actually see those, and typically it's going to, it's only going to um, be emailed or communicated in another uh, secure fashion. Now, on the advisories, which is where we are going to focus today, we're going to look at some of the idiosyncrasies of what these advisories and how we need to be able to read these. So this is an advisory, and I'm not trying to throw any manufacturer under the bus. Don't, don't think that for a moment. Um, um, this one is recent um, within the last week, and it has an extremely high CCSV score, score which we will uh, review on the next slide. But the things that we need to look at is uh, the advisory date. So if, if we look up at the top, and we look at the ISC advisory, and it has an ICSA-21. What that tells you is that advisory came out in 2021. Below that, you can look at the original release date, June 15 of 2021. And then as we look down into the executive summary, you'll see the CVSS score. This score is from zero to 10. 10 being the highest vulnerability rate um, so the com the complexity that is needed um, to access or exploit this vulnerability is very very low um, talks about the equipment and it talks a little bit about what the vulnerability is towards the end. Sorry, I should have uh, done my advances here. So we're gonna look at the CVSS now. So the common vulnerability scoring system. Uh, so if you see up top, um, there are two ratings. Some of the older ones are going to have the uh, version two ratings. Uh, most of the newer ones that are being rated out there today are on version three. Uh, gives a little bit more range. And so the CDS, CDSS V3 score of 9.8 is fairly high. We talk, it talks about what is the attention. So it's an exploitable, remote, or low attack complexity. Who is the vendor? Which equipment is being affected? And what is the vulnerabilities? And when we move down, we look at what is the risk eva uh, evaluation. But in the technical details, the thing we need to look at is the effective products. And so it tells you that it's a quick PLC CPU module, gives you the model number, and it gives you the firmware that's affected, anything prior to 3.0. Now, if we think about when we went back into the asset uh, discovery and documentation phase, where we, we went and we found out what was on the plant floor and what were those um, model manufacturer, model number, and firmware version, 
This is where we need this information. It goes on down into the vulnerability overview. I'm not going to spend any time on that. Um, this particular uh, advisory has about five or six um, overviews on it. Um, one of the thing I'll mention, if you look in the lower right hand uh, corner of the screen, uh, where it talks about the uh, CVSS uh, V3 base score of 9.8, and it gives you the vector screen. When you go to one of these uh, advisories, you can go down and click on that uh, vector string and it will bring you and show you um, a little bit more detail of how they came up with the uh, CVSS score of 9.8. So moving on with the uh, advisory, it gives a little bit of back, about background on uh, where this equipment is typically found. Um, what countries or areas are they deployed? And where is the location headquarters for that particular manufacturer? It also talks about the researchers that um, discovered the vulnerability and reported it. Typically, these will either be reported directly to the manufacturer or they can be reported directly to um, Department of Homeland Security who will reach out and work with the manufacturer um, to help them and, and assist them in uh, working through the mi uh, mitigation strategies that are needed. So the mitigation mitigation strategy for this particular advisory is uh, they developed new firmware um, that took action against those vulnerabilities, and their recommendation is just to update the firmware. We've all had this, but. How does this help you as a systems integrator with your customers? Well, it helps you provide the advisory notification to your customers. And if you've done the asset discovery and documentation side of this, you know that they have a piece of infected equipment. Everybody thinks, okay, so ISC plant floor, you know, it's, it is, uh, it's so shielded from the outside world. Well, I think we, we talked about that earlier. It's not. And it's becoming more and more of a threat today. And we'll talk about what those threats are as we move forward. Um, it also provides you uh, to provide customer guidance information on uh, possibly this is uh, legacy equipment and there's an upgrade path that you can provide for them. Um, so you can issue a, um, you can provide a service agreement to them to implement or update these uh, changes, uh, as well as provide guidance, uh, possibly an upgrade path, uh, possibly some uh, network modifications at this point. Um, and while you're on site providing these services, you have the ability to update the other information on the information and document management phase. So you're not gonna be there every day. Um, but at the end of the day, they have to take some ownership on this as well. And uh, so at this point, any applications that may be, um, that have been worked on internally or another systems integrator or another OEM has came in and made changes to a program, this gives you the ability to update your offsite storage information. Now, the fourth pillar, if you will, in this is automated OT network monitoring. Um, the first three are critical. This one has a critical nature to it. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, this would probably be one of the last things that I would integrate um, as you move forward in this plan. Um, there are many great products out there that do automated OT network monitoring. Some of them are PC-based, some of them are appliance-based, standalone. Um, so, you know, gives you the ability to provide, install, and maintain their network monitoring software. So 
The question is, what is this uh, network monitoring um, software appliance going to provide uh, for you and for your customer? Well, it's going to help track and notify of new end devices. So when somebody connects to the control network, if uh, if it's a new MAC address, if it's a uh, has a new IP address, um, there'll be a notification sent. There'll be some tracking of that when it was connected, where it was connected to, uh, actually what port on what switch it was actually connected to. You'll be able to track and notify of devices that go offline. When did that device come into the network? How long did they stay on? When did they go off? Not necessarily what they're connecting to and what actions they're taking. Um, that's a much deeper dive into uh, you know, threat detection. Um, and then of course, uh, monitor traffic bandwidth. And we'll talk about a little bit about the, uh, the traffic bandwidth issue in a little bit, um, but it is kind of a big deal. So the response and recovery phase. Again, each and every one of these holds merit into its level of importance. Um, but the response and the recovery support that you provide to your customers is where the rubber meets the road. And so if, if we talk about um, what are, what do those items look like? Let's get into them. So first you need to have a response plan. And this is a response plan you as a systems integrator. Uh, who has access to the documentation? Who is going to respond? Um, you're going to work with uh, your end user and you're going to find out who your POC is, your point of contact. Um, you're going to generate your plans for if there is an event, what is going to happen? Um, this should be done quarterly with the end user. Now, internally as a systems integrator, you need to ensure that your response plans are updated. And so from the tested perspective, you probably need to uh, do a mock at least quarterly. Um, if you do the mock quarterly, it gives you the ability to go out, be on site, um, talk to the plant manager, find out uh, if any equipment has came in, what are the plans over the next quarter for equipment that are coming in, um, work on the on your response plan at that point of how you're going to integrate that into uh, your asset discovery documentation and your information and document management systems. How is that information going to be provided to you? What are you going to do with it afterwards? Um, who is the OEM? Um, when do they do on site? I mean, these are all things you become intimate with your customer on every aspect of everything that's going on in their plant. Uh, so you want to test your your uh, response plans at least quarterly with with the end user. Now, internally as a systems integrator, you need to update your response plans at a minimum monthly. This isn't something that you're actually going to go out, provide the service to your customer and walk away, hand them a documentation and be done with it. It doesn't work like that. Um, so as we all know, unfortunately, uh, sometimes uh, we have somewhat of a revolving door when it comes to personnel. Uh, maybe we have somebody who comes in with another skill set. Um, do we have the latest and greatest software? Um, who has all of the software to support that specific customer on their laptop? Uh, you know, there, there are contingency plans that need to be bought out as you move forward uh, internally on executing your response plan. And uh, that's everything from who is on vacation to who is going out on sick leave, um, who is going to respond for your customers. Uh, and then, uh, again, quarterly, you need to coordinate and communicate with all the stakeholders at, at your customer. Uh, 
from the plant manager to the CEO, all the way down to the maintenance personnel. You need to understand what this equipment is doing, how it's operating, um, what are the challenges they're facing today. Um, the benefit to this is you're aware of what's going on. You're going to be able to get them back up and running quickly when they have an issue, whether that be cyber related or maintenance related. And then it gives you the ability to provide uh, migration or upgrade paths or other services to your customers that we should be doing on a daily basis anyways, and being proactive with your customer instead of in a reactive state when a machine goes down. Um, so the CEO and the plant managers are gonna be extremely happy that you're providing budgeting information um, for them moving forward um, as well. And then of course, yearly, test your plan. And I don't mean just running through it. I mean, actually uh, have the customer call in saying they have an issue. See how long it takes your people, your folks, your employees, everyone to respond to this mock. Um, plant manager, CEO, engineering manager, have them pick two, three, four devices, IPC, PC, PLC, go out there to do a re-image, do a, uh, a download to them, um, have them do a quality check, see how long it takes to actually get this thing back up and running. I think you'll be quite surprised and you'll be able to uh, fine tune your plan as you move forward a little bit further down the, down, the, down the road with this. So future trends and challenges. Well, you know, huh, this is a, a, a pretty big statement at the end of the day. Um, so we have internal challenges as systems integrator finding qualified candidates. The end users uh, certainly are having even more challenges uh, when it comes to finding qualified people. And then we have uh, the OT, where we have cybersecurity in general. And uh, the cybersecurity uh, personnel needs as we move forward or exponentially going to grow. Uh, if we look at IT and the things that have gone on with IT over the years, um, I would expect that we are going to see a three to five hundred percent growth in OT cybersecurity over the next five to eight years. Uh, so today, the threat is ransomware. But what is it tomorrow? Well, if we really think about what tomorrow is, tomorrow is more focused attacks on manufacturing production. Um, our adversaries are very smart. They're very intelligent, and most of them are overseas. And if we start thinking about really um, specifically with the colonial pipeline and the meatpacking and uh, our government wanting to bring semiconductor manufacturing back to the U.S. due to the chip shortages, um, this, put, this puts a lot of countries at risk in, in their manufacturing base. And so what they're going to do is they're going to be working towards trying to secure their place in the manufacturing space as we bring manufacturing back to the United States. So what do they do? It's not a ransomware attack. They're going in uh, and they're going to be destroying ICS systems. Um, and this is a huge problem for our supply chain as we move forward. So how are they going to do this? Well, they're going to target campaigns on service providers, service providers such as OEMs, building automation systems uh, integrators, systems integrators, and this one might surprise you a little bit about repair centers. So let's think about repair centers just for a minute. There's a DVR. Uh, DVR has an issue and hard drive fails and you send it to the manufacturer, whether you send it to the manufacturer or uh, the end user 
sends it to the manufacturer. And this is a plant for DD, uh, NVR or DDR. Uh, it goes to the repair center. The repair center service guy has a laptop that he connects to it and does diagnostics on it. Well, for an adversary, I sent one in two days earlier. It had malware in it, which went into his laptop. And every device he connects after that has that malware in it. He does what he needs to do. He sends it back to the customer. The customer plugs it into their network. They're compromised. Repair facilities. Uh, it's kind of a scary thought. This can be IPCs. This can be PCs. Uh, this can be anything. This can be a PLC. Um, it's a scary thought when we really start thinking about what the attack vectors are and uh, what our, the access that our adversaries have to get into our industrial control systems. So as we move forward, what resources are available to you um, to learn more? Well, first and foremost is US search. Um, US search is going to provide you with timely information, um, not only about on the IT side, but on the ISC side, um, the ICS side, industrial control systems side of the house. Um, secondly is ISA. If you do not have access to or uh, ISA standard 62443, highly recommend getting a copy of that. It'd be the best place to start. Um, other ones are NIST, uh, National Institute uh, of Standards. Um, one of the other certification courses that are out there, and it's fairly new for industrial control system, is the GIAC. Um, I'm not that familiar with the GIAC uh, industrial control system certifications, so I can't speak too much about it. Um, and then, of course, AWWA has quite a bit uh, of information as well. So, as we talked about earlier, I'm going to talk a little bit, very briefly, about cybersecurity framework. So, if what is cybersecurity framework? So, cybersecurity framework is easy. There, there are five functional areas, and the first is to identify. You need to identify what you have. You need to identify what the threat is. You need to protect against that threat. You need to protect your assets. Then you need to detect uh, an intrusion or, or uh, an attack. You need to be able to respond to that attack. Most of the time in the IT world, the respond is putting firewall rules, shutting down access to servers, closing channels. Um, and then you need to be able to have the ability to recover. Um, so that's as far as I'm going to go uh, in cybersecurity framework. It's really just to uh, make sure that you're aware of what the cybersecurity framework is. And this is a great place to, to think about as you move forward. So based on that, what now? How do we get started? Uh, what is your path? to providing these services. First and foremost, I would say, again, uh, download a copy of the standard, the ISA standard 62443. Pick your best customer, the one you trust the most, the one that trusts you. Uh, maybe not do the whole plant, maybe just pick a, a, a manufacturing area. Um, develop your plan together with them um, from start to finish. Use the ISA document as a as a as a lead, you don't have to do everything in the ISA four three four two six two four four three, but there are, there are critical things that need to be done. Some of the which I just covered um, to protect them. Once you get your processes in place and you're comfortable, um, then you can expand that. Um, there's a little bit of documentation. There's a little bit of 
technical expertise, but as systems integrators, we have that. We understand the OT floor. We understand the industrial control systems. We're at an advantage over the IT personnel. IT personnel can do a lot on the network side, but when it comes down to the PLCs, the code, um, serial devices, we're needed. And the last but not least, test your plan. And with that, I'm going to open it up for any questions. And um, James? Perfect. Daryl, great presentation that was uh, full of great content and insights about cybersecurity. You know, as you all saw during the presentation, there is a lot of content uh, and a lot of challenges in the market today that uh, need to be addressed. And as we see advancements and more adoption with IAOT solutions, you know, it's critical that we have the framework, the tools and the resources to address the cybersecurity needs and protocols. Uh, so again, very grateful for everyone joining us today. Um, Daryl, we did have a few questions come through. Um, the first one uh, came through was, does the Panduit interview system meet the parameters set forth by ISA 62443 for visualization and documentation of ICS networks? So on the visualization and documentation aspect of uh, 62443, yes, it does. Uh, in terms of the alerts, uh, it's going to provide that as well. Uh, it's an appliance-based product, so it's not, it's a standalone appliance. Uh, it's very reasonably priced, uh, and it's very easy to configure. So I do highly recommend that specific product. Perfect. Uh, another one that came through, and, and Lisa, I, I might send this to you. Um, we had a question come through for how can we get more information for cybersecurity insurance as a systems integrator? I do have a slide and my closing comments, I will give the, um, the contact information, but basically just www.controlsys.org backslash insurance will get you to the landing page that has some content there. We also have our partner on the call today, Gloria Forbes. She has up the insurance program for CSIA and I'm sure she'd be happy to talk to you directly as well if you had questions about that. Thanks for that softball, James. <laughs> hey, happy to help. Um, you know, with that, I, I know we're coming to the top of the hour. Um, if we didn't uh, address any questions or something comes up after the call, I've included here on this last slide and also in the chat feature, uh, contact information for Daryl and myself. Um, feel free to reach out to me, email, my cell phone's listed. Uh, I'm active on, on LinkedIn as well. But if we've not had a chance to work together yet, I'm really excited to be part of CSIA and look forward to working with all of the member companies um, this is an exciting topic and, and lots of areas for, for growth. Um, you know, Graybar, with our uh, infrastructure, our industrial automation sales teams, we are really well positioned to support our system integrators as they integrate cybersecurity into their portfolio or if they augment it, if it's already part of their business. Uh, so we would love to have discussions with you to understand where you are in your own journey with your business and see how we can support your efforts and drive your growth. Um, again, really appreciate the opportunity to present to all of you today. Uh, Daryl, fantastic content, um, you know, very great insights. We will be sharing a recording of this on CSI's website, and we'll be sharing a copy of the deck as well. Uh, Lisa, with that, I'll, I'll pass it to you. Sure. Sandra, will you please put up um, those final slides for us? I appreciate it. I think, uh, Daryl, you need to stop sharing yours, and then Sandra can... The next one's up. Oh. On behalf of CSIA, I would like to thank Daryl and James for this informative discussion. I'd also like to thank Ray Barr for sponsoring this event. And of course, thank you for attending. I'd also like to remind you that we talked about the recording. I'm not even going to go there. Be sure to bookmark the CSIA events calendar so you don't miss any upcoming events. Next slide, please, Sandra. One final resource for you, as I mentioned, this is the landing page where you can find out more information about the insurance program, including the cybersecurity insurance that you might be interested in. And finally, next slide, Sandra, I've put up the contact info for CSIA. 
if you need anything, if you have any questions about membership or I don't know, how to find stuff on the website, we're here for you all the time. Happy to help. And once again, thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you.